All right, good afternoon. I am Lynn Paddock, Assistant Professor in the Russian Department and lead organizer of the conference, Mediating the New Cold War in the Digital Age. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the first event and keynote of the conference. The inspiration of the conference dawned last winter when my colleague Michael Gronis and I were lamenting the sad state of relations between Russia and the West. Michael and I are of the same generation. 25 years ago, we were the age that our Dartmouth students are now. Um, but and it was an unprecedented moment in history. The 50-year-old world order, defined by unshakable enmity between the West and the Soviet Union, and shadowed by the threat of mutual annihilation, dissolved, and it dissolved largely of its own accord, peacefully and happily. The political scientist Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history. But the rock group, Jesus Jones, captured the elation of the moment when they sang, right here, right now, there's no place I'd rather be, watching the world wake up from history. Sadly, Jesus Jones proved as wrong as Francis Fukuyama. And 25 years later, Michael and I wondered just how the world had fallen asleep again. State leaders and policies are hardly innocent in this. But our main question was what role our collective dream weaver, the media, has played. We conceived the idea to bring together a group of the most insightful journalists, editors, scholars, and policy experts to illuminate how we have relapsed into the same dream of a new cold, old Cold War with the same narrative and tropes, despite new technologies and platforms like Facebook that promise to break down borders and barriers, but just as often insidiously perpetuate them. Thanks to the very generous support of a Fanny and Alan Leslie Dartmouth Conference grant and the co-sponsorship of the Dickey Center for International <laughs> Understanding, and also thanks to my co-organizers, Petra McGillan and Yulia Komske, we were able to realize the inspiration. It is true and a truism that the media is a pillar of, one of the pillars of democracy, paradoxically a key means of keeping us awake at the same time as it weaves our dreams. The West has a distinguished tradition of investigative journalism and uncompromising reporting. Likewise, despite perennial state censorship and authoritarian regimes, Russian journalism boasts a brilliant, brilliant literary journalist and fiercely courageous reporters. Our keynote speaker today, Masha Gessen, belongs to both traditions. Masha emigrated to the U.S. with her family in 1981 in order to escape the persecution to which Soviet Jews were routinely subjected. In 1991, she returned to the former Soviet Union as a reporter and writer and was chief editor of the magazine Around the World. As an outspoken activist for LGBT rights and an unceasing critic of Vladimir Putin, Masha found Russia increasingly inhospitable and returned to the United States in 2013. In the meantime, she publishes prolifically in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, Harper's, that is not to exhaust them all. She has also published important and critically acclaimed books on contemporary Russia, including a biography, The Man Without a Face, the unlikely rise of Vladimir Putin, and words will break cement, the passion of pussy riot. Currently, Masha holds a Carnegie Ma Millennial Fellowship, which enables her to work simultaneously on two new projects. One, a small photographic essay with Misha Friedman about the Russian memory wars, provisionally entired, entitled Never Remember, and a second larger book project 
about the reconstitution or retrofitting of totalitarianism. I will ask you now to please help me welcome Masha Gessen. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's very good to be here. Is my mic on? Yes, thank you. Um, so I had a fascinating experience last month in St. Petersburg. And it was so good that, uh, and so illuminating that I decided that everyone should have this experience. But because I can't take you all to St. Petersburg with me, I'm going to bring St. Petersburg here. Uh, or this particular place in St. Petersburg. There's a museum in St. Petersburg called the museum, uh, the Russian State Museum of Political History, which is actually a wonderful museum. But as often happens with Russian organizations, especially ones funded from the federal budget, it is weighted down with some institutions that it may not necessarily welcome, or at least that's what I've been told. And one of them is a branch of the Museum of Political History that is housed in a KGB building in St. Petersburg. It's not officially called the Museum of the KGB, but it is effectively a museum of the KGB. But officially, it's, 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 it's a branch of the, um, of the Russian Museum of Political History on Garokhova Ulitsa. Interestingly, it is not on Garokhova Ulitsa, but, um, uh, but it is, it, it, it is, it is in, a, uh, in a KGB building. And there's a tour there for high school students on the history of the KGB. So I'm going to take you on this tour. And just to sort of situate us, um, the, the, the core exhibit of the history of the KGB is all housed in a room much, much smaller than this one. And um, it begins, begins with, a, with a sort of short segment of wall, let's say from, from where the break in this wall is to, to the corner, right? Uh, and we're gonna start there. The, I transcribed the tour, and I'm going to reproduce the tour for you with a little bit of interpretation. Could we dim the lights so the, uh, the, the slides are seen better? Thank you. Okay. So um, the tour guide, be tour guide begins by telling students that the KGB um, started in the 1950s, which is an interesting interpretation of history. Uh, and she says that it began quite logically because. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Let there be. But. Uh, uh, there, it's an interesting interpretation of history, but um, what she's saying is that when Nikita Khrushchev became the Soviet leader, he realized that all the uniformed services uh, that worked inside the country were concentrated in a single pair of hands, which obviously, and it's important in the tour to point out things that are obvious, which obviously is not right, so he decided to break it up and, um, and launch the KGB, which, be, which w would be the, uh, the Soviet State Security Agency. And he needed, obviously, someone who he could trust to run the KGB, and that person was Ivan Sirov. And Ivan Sirov was someone that Khrushchev knew from Ukraine, uh, from working together in Ukraine in the 1930s. And then she poses the first question uh, to these high school students. She says, what were the 1930s in our country's history? Those were the years of repressions, the genocide of our own nation. Okay. So it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm just, as we go along, I'm going to point out some words that are not said. And um, you know, just a spoiler, there is very little in the store that is not factually accurate. Right. Uh, there's a little bit of fudging, but mostly it's quite factually accurate. But I think it's interesting to look at how sort of this, this kind of history is conducted. So the word that is not said is terror. And that word will never be said in this entire tour of the KGB Museum because terror is, um, well, uh, terror has, uh, ha has an agent. Right? There is someone who uh, engages in terror. 
whereas repressions are things that just happen. Uh, repressions are a little bit like a force of nature. At least that's, you know, that's, that's the current narrative of what the repressions are. So Khrushchev worked with Serov in Ukraine in the 1930s. And these are people who played an integral part in the repressions. Um, what she doesn't mention is that actually Serov didn't get to Ukraine until 1939. This is not a key part of Serov's career. Uh, Serov was the architect of the deportations of uh, ethnic groups, of the, uh, the Chechens being the largest, from the North Caucasus. He was one of the main, uh, he was a, one of the generals who um, entered Berlin as part of the Soviet forces, and he was famous within the, um, the Soviet nomenklatura for not only have marauded more extravagantly than the rest of the, uh, of the brass, but for having gotten away with marauding, which wasn't the case for, for, for all of them. He was heavily involved in purges in Poland. And finally, he was the curator of the gulag in the, 19, uh, in the 1940s and early 50s, up until Stalin's death. Uh, but none of that is mentioned. Uh, what is mentioned is that both Sirov and Khrushchev were, played a part in the repressions, these, these very abstract repressions. And when Serov came to lead the KGB, he started reforming it, getting rid of people who took part in the repressions. But he himself had blood on his hands. Um, this is a key moment in the, in the tour because this is, this is sort of an emotional high. Uh, she points out that there's something not quite smooth in this, in this story. Um, and um, there's a message here, right? Everyone in the KGB, or lots of people in the KGB, took part in the repressions. He tried to clean out the people who were part of the repressions. But of course, he had blood on his hands himself. And so did Khrushchev, who, who appointed him, right? So there's, no, there's not going to be a clear story about what happened, we began with the question, what, uh, what were the 1930s in the history of our country, but there's not going to be a clear story about that because everyone was everything, right? And no one has a claim to, uh, to a moral high ground, which is very, very important. So then we've, uh, we got to this corner, uh, and now we have a wall of directorates of the KGB, directorates one through four. And these were the directorates that uh, are pers uh, in this exhibit uh, represented by portraits of generals, uh, uh, medals that uh, were given to these generals, a little bit of spy paraphernalia, not very much, uh, personal possessions, gifts that they brought from abroad, you know, just, just sort of this mishmash. She speeds through this, uh, uh, the, the directorates one through four very quickly. And then we come to the next question. Why, but why was the KGB so widely disliked? Good question. And there's sort of a pause there. And we've gotten, we've gotten to that corner now. And that entire wall is directorate number five. So that's, that's when she asks, why was the KGB so widely disliked? Well, there was one aspect to KGB activities that wasn't so good. Uh, <laughs> this was its fight against dissidents. Um, everything else the KGB did was great, but this wasn't so good. This was its fight against dissidents. And obviously, you have to explain what dissidence is. When someone thinks differently from everyone else, and she's addressing a, a group of high school students. So, you know, you understand. When someone is different from everyone else, as in a high school context, uh, this is called dissidence. Now, what's not being said at this point? Right, is any word in the past tense. This is a normal situation that everyone thinks the same way and whoever doesn't think that way is called a dissident. Um, and I think this is a really, really important, uh, as, as, as Lynn mentioned, I'm writing a book about memory wars, and this is a really important point in every story that we see coming from, from, from the state about the past 
which is that there's no division between past and present. There's no conversation about memory, and in a way, even calling what I'm writing about memory wars is misleading because you have memory when you have an idea of past and present, or past versus present. Whereas this story doesn't contain it, right? It's, it's, it, this is completely normal. You would have uh, someone who is an outcast, obviously in a high school context you would, uh, who is called a dissident. And when Andropov comes to lead the KGB, he expresses an idea that's not exactly novel. Western secret agencies are conducting ideological and psychological war against us. Is this idea correct? Not was this idea correct. Is this idea correct? Of course it's correct. Um, if you pick up a newspaper today, you will see that this war is going on. We're conducting this war, and Western secret agencies are conducting this war. This is what secret agencies do. Right? Uh, we've completely dispensed with any idea of past. And what she doesn't, again, what she doesn't say is she doesn't say anything that might divide the past from the present. Uh, this war is going on. We are conducting this war. And Western secret agencies are also conducting this war. And you open any newspaper today and you see it. So let's recap what we've learned so far. Uh, we're a little bit like we're still in that corner over there. What we've learned is that no one has a claim to the moral high ground, that there's no division between past and present, and that it is this job of secret agencies everywhere to fight ideological and psychological wars. That's what they do, that's what they've always done, that's what they still do. Um, but still, the pending question is why was the KGB not liked so much? Um, well, because there are problems. Any battle must be waged in accordance with the law. The criminal justice system had Article 70. And I'm, 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 I'm translating very consciously here. She doesn't say the penal code. She doesn't say you know, the Soviet laws. She says the criminal justice system had Article 70, which provided punishment for dissidents. Incarceration, exile from the country, and when you're punished in accordance with the law, that's one thing. It may be unjust, but it's legal. But when the methods used are illegal, that's something else. Up until the 1970s, prevention work was against the law. Preve prevention is, she says, prophylactica. Right? Um, and then we, we, we go to the first stand. Uh, so we've, we've seen Andropov there. And now the next stand is this interesting stand that has handwritten letters in it. Some of them are barely legible, some of them are quite clear. These are uh, letters that are written by Moscow State University students to a member of the Moscow State University administration who was responsible for the prophylaxirovanya. She, she did prevention work with them. Uh, and the letters are uh, they're quite detailed, they're quite long, uh, and they say things like, you know, Dragaya Yelena Borisovna, dear Yelena Borisovna, this is what I'm doing this summer. I'm, I've gotten a good job. I've, uh, uh, I'm, I'm working in a, in a, on, a, on a construction site. I've, apl I've applied to be inducted into the, uh, the Komsomol organization, or you know, I've applied for, for this and that. They're, they're, they're um, reporting on their progress as socially responsible citizens, Soviet citizens, these um, Moscow University students. Now, if you're confused right now right, I've, uh, uh, about what this has to do with Article 70 and with being exiled from the country and with, uh, uh, with what prophylactica is in general. Well, so are the, 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 the people, these young people on tour, obviously. Right? Uh, and she says to them, look, this is, um, these are letters uh, written by students who weren't kicked out of Moscow State University. Right? If they had been punished in accordance with the law, then they would have been arrested for their dissonant activities. Because the law was harsh, it may have been unjust, but it was the law. But instead they weren't kicked out illegally. They were instead, they, they, had, uh, the, they were talked with. They were prophylaxirovane. Uh, and um, she says, here are some letters written by prevention uh, objects, prophylaxirovane, uh, 
uh, to Elena Borisovna Kazitska, a deputy dean at Moscow State University, there is no bitterness or anger in these letters. These people are being worked with. That's better than being expelled from university. They are grateful. She also, as an aside, says that if they had been expelled to the, uh, from university, they would have gone and become street cleaners or um, heating plant workers, dvorniki or kachigare. And she says, you know, uh, all the rock music came from those people, from the kachigare. Uh, which, which only you know, makes, makes us more confused because at this point we have no idea why, why, why wouldn't we want the Moscow State University to become rock musicians by way of, uh, of becoming heating plant employees. But they are grateful. Now, um, what's, well, basically what, the, uh, what the, uh, all of this little part boils down to is that she's explaining that some, uh, the law was, was very harsh. Uh, some things that were done outside the law uh, were, not so, what, were not so harsh. People were grateful. It was kinder to them. Uh, what she's not saying is that she's completely turned things upside down. Prophylactica, there's nothing illegal about prophylactica. Prophylactica was a practice introduced in the 1960s uh, under Brezhnev and in fact was very much seen within the KGB and within the, uh, the, uh, the, the communist leadership as a sort of softening, uh, very much for Western consumption, uh, this idea that you know, instead of just sending people directly to jail, we're going to work with them to make them productive uh, members of society. Yes? Can she tell the students what she or he has done? Oh, no, we already know that, the, that if you think differently from somebody else, that's called dissidence. Not specifically, no. We'll get to that in a second. She, but uh, she's holding them in suspense just as I'm holding you in suspense. We don't know what they did. We don't know anything about these people. And the letters, there are no signatures on the letters. So they're, 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 they're completely unidentifiable. But, but they're displayed as sort of genuine artifact, artifacts. Uh, so what, what was actually illegal was what she says was part of the law, which was expulsion from the country. Article 70 of the Penal Code of the Russian Federa Federated Soviet Republic, uh, Socialist Republic, was, um, uh, well, I'm not going to read it out loud, but basically that's the entire text. It provided for um, internal exile, it provided for imprisonment. It certainly did not provide for expulsion from the country, which was never uh, in any guise legal in the Soviet Union. Um, so what have we learned so far? Nobody has a moral, uh, claim to moral high ground. There is no division between past and present. It is the job of secret agencies everywhere to fight ideological and psychological wars. And some measures are lawful, but just. Uh, uh, yeah, some, uh, some, some measures are lawful, but unjust, sorry. While others are humane, but unlawful. Right. Um, so we're still, we're still thinking about why people dislike the KGB. And now she's, she's sort of backtracking to explain uh, where these strange dissidents came from. Uh, so when the thaw began, people thought they would be reading Akhmatova and other band poets. Uh, we're, we're in St. Petersburg. Uh, but the thaw ended with the Prague events in Budapest. Uh, but people can change so fast. People like Yuli Daniel continue to write about what they would like to see the country become. This was called dissidence. Uh, so these people were a little slow on the uptake. Things were changing, and they, uh, and they didn't see them changing. They were still reading Akhmatova and writing about what they would like to see the country become. What is not said is that Prague is not in Budapest. Uh, but. Um, but I, I mean, that was my absolute favorite moment of the entire tour <laughs> because I think that Prague events in Budapest is a perfect uh, summary of, uh, of Soviet policy in Eastern Europe uh, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, you know, they were all Prague events in Budapest. Uh, so um, just just in case anybody is confused, uh, Budapest, in 1956, uh, the Soviet Union 
brutally suppressed a, um, an uprising in Budapest, um, arresting hundreds of people, exiling 5,000 people uh, and uh, in, a, in a tiny country of 90 million people, and basically imposing military rule. In 1968, uh, Prague Spring happened. There was a, uh, a movement for the liberalization of the socialist regime in Ch the Czech Republic, and Soviet tanks rolled in once again. So um, the, uh, these are generally known as uh, Prague events or Budapest events, but you could also call them Prague events in Budapest. Um, and now suddenly we're, uh, we're now sort of around the blackboard. And there's a stand on which there are some pictures. There is a picture of Yuli Daniel, uh, who was mentioned earlier. And there's also a picture of Boris Yevdakimov. Uh, oh, sorry, the, his Boris Yevdakimov. Um, and um, uh, Boris Yevdakimov, she says, uh, Boris Yevdakimov was published, uh, she just says Yevdakimov. Yevdakimov was published by Pasev. Now you can easily find it on the internet. But it was affiliated with the fascists and financed by the CIA. Um, now, uh, Pasev was a journal that was published by Narodna uh, Trudavoy Sayus, the People's Labor Union, which was indeed a, an organization of Russian exiles that uh, uh, it, at the beginning of World War II thought it would be a really great idea if uh, Hitler uh, took over the Soviet Union because then the Bolsheviks would be no more. Uh, after World War II, the CIA, uh, CIA indeed was funding the publication of Pasev. Now, what's not said is that the Nazi and C uh, uh, CIA affiliations belong to two distinct historical periods. But of course, we have no historical periods, right? And uh, except for when we started in the 30s, which were also the 50s. Uh, Everything keeps getting mushed together, Prague and Budapest, you know, past and present, uh, and the Nazis in the CIA. So he should have been charged with espionage in accordance with the law, obviously, right? If he wrote for Pasev, which was funded by the fascists and the CIA at the same time, he was clearly a spy. But instead, he was confined to a psychiatric institution. We're still answering the question of why people didn't like the KGB so much. Uh, What's not said it was that Yevdokimov was neither a spy nor insane. Uh, he should no more have been charged with espionage than, with, uh, than placed in a psychiatric institution. It's also, his, his, uh, he spent a lot of time in different camps. He was incarcerated variously. His son was incarcerated. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is a long and tragic story of a man who spent his entire life waging battle against the Soviet regime. And of course, uh, uh, in the eyes of the regime, writing for Pasev was far from his only, uh, uh, his only breach, he, um, his only transgression. It was actually published in all the emigre publications and he was published underground. Uh, he, was, he was a historian and he wrote, he wrote mostly in history. But boiling it down to Pasev, the fascists, uh, the CIA, espionage, and psychiatric institutions sort of encapsulates it in, 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 in a nicely digestible way. So what have we learned so far? No moral high ground, no division between past and present, secret agencies everywhere the same, uh, uh, lawful, unjust, humane, unlawful, you know, these things are really difficult to, to navigate. The dissidents were naive and sympathetic slow, like Daniel, but also spied for the fascists, the CA, and the internet. Uh, on the next stand, we see the picture, uh, photographs of another dissident, Pyotr Yekir. And the tour guide explains that when these cases began, when uh, Yevdakimov uh, was sent to a psychiatric institution, when Daniel was arrested, uh, the human rights movement appeared. It was headed by Pyotr Yekir, son of General Yekir. What she's not saying is that the human rights movement did not have a head. But there's a, uh, 
there's a very beautiful logic to, to her story uh, here, right? Because, I mean, of course, uh, everything has to be verti vertically constructed. Everything has to have a head. And it makes a lot of sense that, um, that the head of the, uh, of the human rights movement would be someone who is dynastically predisposed to being the head of, some, of something, like the son of a general. She doesn't mention that uh, uh, Gen uh, General Iona Yekir was, uh, was, it was a red general who was executed in 1937. And of course, the, the children don't know this. She mentions his name as though they knew who he was. So you know, this General Yekir, who they're supposed to know, uh, and this was his son, and he ran the human rights movement. Um, he was arrested, and he agreed to cooperate with the prosecution. But he cannot be judged harshly, because he was a man who had been through the gulag. Right. Uh, so obviously, uh, we're, we're having a little, bit, a little sort of shadow of Soviet morality here, where uh, there's no transgression greater than agreeing to cooperate with, your, uh, with those who have arrested you, with your accusers. Right? All of a sudden, for just this one second, we're not quite on the side of the KGB in the story. We're actually seeing somebody who's uh, whose uh, cooperation with the KGB might be seen as a transgression, but it shouldn't be, because he was traumatized. Uh, she doesn't go into his story. She doesn't explain how he was traumatized by the Gulag. Uh, in fact, what happened to uh, Pyotr Yikir was that his father, Iona Yikir, was executed in 1937. And Pyotr Yikir uh, ended up in the Gulag as a child, not in an orphanage for children of, of, of uh, enemies of the people but actually in a juvenile prison in the Gulag as a child uh, because he was Ioni um, Ikersan. Then in the 1980s, the Helsinki group was formed. They were also human rights activists. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, none of them came to power because revolutions are brought about by fanatics, but power is held by different people altogether. Well, um, power belongs with bureaucrats in the very much the same way that it makes sense to us that Pyotr Yekir, the son of a general, would be the, le the, the head of the human rights movement. So would, uh, uh, so, so would anybody who is the head of anything be somehow qualified for that position? by an orderly activity and perhaps by, 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 by dint of dissent, but certainly not by being transgressive, by, uh, by not thinking like other people. Right? This is obvious. She does not clarify her point, but she says it in a way that, uh, that, 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 that makes her point very clear. So, so in, the, uh, in addition to what we learned earlier, uh, and last time we left off at how the dissidents we're sort of nice people, but uh, they spied for the fascists, the CIA, and the internet. Now, the dissidents brought about the collapse of the Soviet Union. But they were crazy. They were fanatics. Right? Uh, and political power belongs with the bureaucrats. Uh, so this was the reason the KGB was disliked. This entire time, that for that whole wall, we have been trying to answer that question. And it is indeed a wall that is, that is, that is dedicated to directorate number five. Uh, and what I, think, what I think is interesting about this is that sort of in terms of layout, in terms of proportion, uh, there's something deeply true about this, right? The, uh, certainly the fifth directorate, the, uh, especially in the later part of the, uh, the later decades of the KGB, was its main focus and it is the most important thing to know about the KGB. Uh, so that it makes sense that the exhibit is set up that way, and this is the way, but this is the way it's narrated. narrated. Um, so now we're coming to the end of the tour. There's also a freestanding uh, part of the exhibit on terrorism, which is a bit of a separate story. Um, but we're, uh, and, we, and, and the tour guide runs through it, and she basically explains that terrorism began with the Palestinians uh, hijacking planes uh, and 
then proceed, uh, proceeded with the Soviet dissidents hijacking planes, uh, which was exactly the same as the Palestinians hijacking planes. And so the KGB had to expend a lot of resources in Chechnya and in Gushetia to fight terrorism. Uh, now, Chechnya and Gushetia weren't even separate entities, uh, never mind seen as uh, hotbeds of terrorism in the historical period that she's talking about. But that's, that's actually the way, uh, that's a, not just the narration, the way, that's the way the exhibit is set up. And the captions on the uh, exhibits in, in, this, in this little stand mention Chechnya and Ingushetia. Uh, but, um, but now we're, we're, it's, it's, it's time to, to talk about sort of our conclusions. And they says, can you name a single country that survives without a state security service? Obviously, there were reasons to, to dislike the KGB, but can you name a single country like that? Well, I've been talking at you for half an hour, and you're still not saying anything. There is no such country. Every country has a state security service. What she doesn't say is that some countries don't have security services that persecute dissidents. So this is what we've learned. Um, and I'm going to, to run through this again. So no one has a claim to moral high ground. There's no division between past and present. Prague is in Budapest. It is the job of, the, of secret agencies everywhere to fight ideological and psychological wars, uh, even if they might sometimes be disliked by some people for it. Some measures are lawful but unjust, while others are humane but unlawful. The dissidents fight for fascists, the CIA, and the internet. The dissidents brought about the collapse of the Soviet Union, but they were crazy. Political power belongs with bureaucrats, and all countries are basically the same. Um, and I'm going to say it one more time. There is no such country that doesn't have a state security service. But such services must work in accordance with the law. And what if they work outside the law, or above the law, or in the interests of one person? What will happen then? 1937 will happen then. We've already, we started in 1937. This is a well-narrated tour, right? We, we're, we're ending exactly where we started in 1937, when there were these people who were up to their elbows in blood because repressions happened. Now the security services work under parliamentary oversight. So in addition to everything else we've learned, we have learned that it is not 1937. So just for your convenience, I have um, boiled down each of these points uh, into, into, a simplified, into a simplified form. Uh, so it's a little bit of a joke. But, um, but actually, I think that uh, the reason uh, I decided to take you on this little tour is because I think that uh, it's a wonderful example uh, of, on the one hand, the cacophony and the mess that uh, the narration of history is in Russia today, and not just history, right? The narration of Russia is in Russia today. Uh, and often, uh, there are two temptations when we interpret these kinds of texts. Uh, one temptation is to say that it's such a mess that uh, it's so cacophonous, in fact, that it can't possibly make any sense and it can't possibly be considered propaganda because as propaganda it would be so ineff ine ineffective because what message is it really conveying? And I'm sure all of you have heard that particular criticism. Uh, there's another temptation, uh, and that temptation, and this, we hear this especially when people talk about what is happening with memory, uh, and, with, and with specific sites of memory, we hear people say a lot, well, 
actually what they're doing now is they're glorifying the gulag, they're glorifying the secret services, and that's the opposite of the story that we were telling in the 90s. And that's not really accurate either. Right? The story that is being told is a mess, uh, and it is cacophonous, but it is a mess that rests on a very specific worldview. And this worldview is consistent throughout the various uh, uh, stories that we're hearing out of Russia. You turn on television, you will basically hear the same worldview expressed. You will hear some variation of all of these points. Um, possibly the two most important ones of them are that the whole world is the same. There is no other place where, uh, there's no place in the world that is in some way better than Russia. There's no place that is less rotten. There may be places that are better at pretending, but ultimately they all do exactly the same thing. This goes to the point of no, nobody having the moral, uh, claim to the moral high ground. It goes to the point of there's no such country that doesn't have a state security service. And um, there's, no, there's no country that, does, that is not corrupt. Uh, I was actually, uh, when I took a taxi from this, uh, from this uh, uh, museum to my next destination, I was treated to a radio program about, on how Russia has ranked among the least corrupt in the countries in the world. And it was a really well-reported uh, program with lots of experts talking about what corruption is and how corruption works. and. Um, uh, and, and, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful example of what I'm talking about, uh, because none of the experts were really trying to make the case that Russia was not corrupt. The case that they were all making was that all countries are corrupt, and perhaps Russia was a little bit better at being corrupt, and that's how it ended up in the uh, as one of the least corrupt countries in this particular ranking. And uh, and of course, uh, this being Russian radio, I never learned the source of this particular ranking. It's a great story, uh, but you know every country is like that. Uh, and if if you're saying that elections are rigged, well, show me a country where elections aren't rigged. Show me a country in which the uh, the, 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 the the party in power doesn't have a vested interest in the outcome of the elections. Oh, you can't show me a country like that. Well, obviously, then elections are rigged everywhere. So. That is at the basis of the worldview. And then the other thing that is, that is extremely important to this worldview is this lack of division between past and present, right? So uh, on one level, that's a story that we hear a lot of sort of the, this, the seamless Russian history with a clear line of succession from Peter the Great to Joseph Stalin to, to Vladimir Putin, right? Uh, and, and it's also the story that, uh, that, that you hear about uh, oh, this is, this, is, this is one of my favorite events of the last couple of days, uh, uh, when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs served the Polish ambassador in, uh, in Moscow with a protest note about the Night Wolves Motorcycle Club uh, not being allowed to, uh, to cross over Poland on their, run, uh, on their run to Berlin uh, to commemorate the 71st anniversary of victory in the Great Patriotic War. The protest note stated that this was particularly, uh, it, it made two points, that it was particularly egregious because Russia had just allowed uh, a delegation headed by Yaroslav Kaczynski to enter Russia to commemorate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the deaths of Yaroslav Kaczynski's twin brother and the entire Polish government uh, uh, in a plane crash in Smolensk. And, uh, and it was a mockery in, of the memory of victims of fascism. Right? So there's, uh, again, both of those uh, aspects of, the, of, of this basic worldview are at play there. Right? One is that the night wolves are direct descendants of the victims of fascism and the fighters against fascism and the people who sacrificed their lives in the fight against fascism. Uh, I'm, air quotes, not because I'm mocking it, but because that's, the, that's a quote. Uh, and um, uh, and you know, the difference between those people who died 75 years ago and the, uh, the, the Polish government, which died in a plane crash five years ago, is non-existence because uh, time doesn't exist, right? Every, time has been smooshed together. 
Uh, and at the same time, there's this moral equival equivalence between, uh, and sort of the equivalence of status between the Night Wolves, a motorcycle club, and the Polish government. And there's the, equivalent, the moral equivalence between the grief that the Night Wolves feel for the victims of fascism and the grief that Yaroslav Kaczynski feels for his twin brother. So that, uh, it, if, you, if you look at any sort of propaganda message, you will find aspects of those per, uh, particular features of the current um, worldview. And I'll stop there. I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, yes. Oh, we're doing mic. Uh -huh. Then I think we can bring the lights back up. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll be probably speaking for all of us. I hope I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank it's just you. terrific uh, substance in delivery and, and the tour. Um, and your final sort of tongue in cheek uh, analysis, uh, I would second everything. The only thing that I didn't see, and actually your, your last comments, I think, sort of were going in that direction, is. I think there is a, it's cacophony, but there is a theme that I hear from Russian students, even here on campus, certainly from some colleagues and unfortunately former dissident friends in Russia, is that Russia is a great country. It has great history and, and it's that sort of, yeah, Stalin did some bad things, but basically was a great leader and so was the Tsar and so, you know, and that kind of nationalism or statism I think that's one theme that goes through that, sort of runs through that cacophony. I don't know how you see that. Uh, I agree, yes. Uh, amendment accepted. <laughs> <laughs> then I think I'm being sort of familiar with this, my wife. <laughs> well, uh, I want to second what my husband said. <laughs> Thank you for this Orwellian picture of what's happening. And I have just a comment, not a question. Unfortunately, your tour guide uh, could get some uh, exhibits uh, from the uh, West. I don't know if you've seen the movie Bridge of Spies, where uh, there is a 1950s uh, Soviet spy and uh, United States being a country of law appoints a government defender for that spy, played brilliantly by Tom Hanks. And this spy, the Soviet spy, is the most charming, intelligent, lovely man. And KGB people portrayed in the movie are, yeah, they're not that pleasant, but CIA folks are total morons. And it's just the message is that, you know, uh, people are nice, and KGB and CIA are of the same ilk, and uh, all the countries are the same. So towards your last bullet, I think it's a perfect illustration. I think that's a great movie, though. And I, I actually read that movie as... Uh as a, as, a, as, a, as a film about the American justice system uh, and the heroism of the Tom Hanks character. But what do I know? I, I, I translate for the Americans, uh, the series. So, so I'm obviously, I've obviously bought into the glamour of the, of the Soviet spy. Um, I, I think I certainly followed your, your tour to of the, of the wall and the vocabulary and the logic of the wall uh, and that was quite convincing but one thing struck me at the very beginning which was uh, kind of surprising to me and that is I understand the point about euphemism, circumlocution, evasive language, everything is everything, moral equivalence, east is west, west is east, everything is everything but, but the word there next to repression, which you said was the word of choice besides terrorism because of the great terror, and every Russian I assume knows that terror has more specific connotations than repression, but the word genocide, and maybe I don't understand what the Russian term for genocide would be, but that of all words in history has a certain specificity and universality in it, and you could say, well, the, you know, the the Holocaust genocide and the Armenian genocide. What is, I guess this is a point of 
vocabulary in fact, but what is the word that is used for genocide in that particular passage? And would that bring out the associations and echoes with the students, high school students seeing, seeing that? Uh, that's a really interesting point. Um, the word she used was genocide, so she, she said genocide. Um, what I find interesting about that, and I wonder if it's a, if it's a current addition to the, uh, to the tour, because uh, she does something, uh, again, she sort of mashes up a lot of history there. She talks about Khrushchev and Sirov working in Ukraine uh, and puts that together with the genocide of our own, uh, of our own people. Right? Now, uh, I think, she, she didn't get any more specific, I think her reference was to the Golodomor, right? Uh, but Golodomor, uh, first of all, happened earlier than either Khrushchev or Sirov got to Ukraine. Second of all, uh, it's pretty p uh, politically loaded at this point uh, in 2016 to talk about genocide of our own people. Uh, and um, because, uh, because it was, uh, was man-made uh, famine that affected, she's talking about Ukraine, that affected Ukrainians, right? It wasn't uh, man-made, uh, Ukraine wasn't the only site of man-made famine, but she's talking about Ukraine. So, I wonder if she's trying to do a zillion things at once there and sort of claim Ukraine at the same time. There was no follow-up to that, right? It sort of, she dropped the word genocide uh, uh, and of our own people once and then she never, she never came back to that. Uh, she focused, uh, uh, for the rest of the tour, she would say the word repressions. I, I guess I would just say, I think you're probably right. It was part of the general mashup of concepts, ideas, periods, history, but in some ways, uh, the word offsets the whole logic of the, of, because to, to mix genocide and repression together is like, talk about uh, oxymoronic, there, there's something crazy Agreed. about no, good that. Point. Good but I mean, I suppose the propaganda itself is kind of crazy too, and so uh, it's just another form of extreme craziness. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for, for speaking here at Dartmouth. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on your idea of memory and, and, and time, because to me it seems like this force of nationalism in fact relies very much on some kind of memories, right? Whether it be Russian involvement in Syria, right? This idea of, of Russia as a great Christian power or Crimea even recalling the memory of Russia or Crimea as being a Russian state. So. How does memory play into this if at the same time the past is being distorted? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the word memory um, can be misused uh, by me, right? Because I think that there are times to talk about memory uh, and especially historical memory and there are times to talk about legacy and the process of inheritance. And I think a lot of what we're, uh, of what we're seeing is, is, is uh, sort of claiming legacy, right? Uh, claiming the status of heir and absolutely refusing to engage in any memory work. Thank you for your presentation. I am an international student from Russia uh -huh. and I grew up in Russia. I went to high school in Russia in Omsk. So it's a Siberian city which is I think much more tolerant to the current government than the center of Russia which you, you were describing. And as a Russian high school student from Omsk, I really have trouble imagining such a tour and such student responses. For example, you have this slide when everybody says correct, uh, when the tour guide asks correct and the students all say correct. Oh, no, no, they don't say anything. No, 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 she says correct. Oh, the students are completely silent throughout the tour. So. Okay, I, I would still have a lot of trouble imagining this uh, or imagining that they didn't know what dissidence is or just imagining Okay, if, if we are not talking about the students, let's talk about the teacher. Like all my teachers in high school, they were very much against the current system. And I think it's obvious because, uh, because uh, they get paid as much as a salesperson. So, and that's very frustrating for many of them. And I, when I see this story, 
I, you said it was a joke. I don't think it was funny. Uh, and I don't think it was informative either. And then my question to you is, why, why do you choose to present uh, your ideas in such a way? Uh, so the, uh, and it is, it is very well accepted here in the U.S. And probably, but probably the majority of this room will agree that Russia, the current system, is corrupt and has many flaws. And probably many high Russian high school students would agree with you, and they are not as oblivious as you presented them. But then, when I see this story, and when I see this presentation, I don't feel like I, I'm receptive to what you're saying, because the way you present, you present to the, uh, you present it so that the American public likes it. But as a Russian student, so I don't, yes, I don't, don't like the current situation, but when I read something that's written in such a way as you presented, I just, don't accept it either. So what, what do you see? Uh, your, what's your own goal as a journalist? So do you come to the US and you uh, vilify Russia? And yes, the government is bad, Putin is bad, and that's it. Or do you try to change something? But if you try to change something, why, why do you not present events so that the Russian public would try? Of course it's hard, okay, but... Can, we, can, can I answer now? I think you, yeah. you've had enough time. Uh, so if your question is why, uh, what's my goal? Uh, I don't have a goal, I have a job. Uh, my oh, job, you, you, yes. can I please? Yeah, uh, uh, my, my job as a journalist is to tell what's out there. I take that job very seriously. I take extreme care to transcribe what I see, uh, what I hear word for word. I take absolute exception to being accused of being inaccurate, uh, which is what you're doing. This is an actual tour that I went on in an actual place in St. Petersburg three weeks ago. I transcribed the tour word for word and presented it here. I choose to present it in the way that I present it because I think it works and I think it is informative. Thank you. Hi. Uh, going back to the actual museum, which uh, when you said basically how small it is, uh, is uh, the main people coming to the museum, would they be you know, the high school students like uh, local students here go to the Monshire Museum of Science, or, obviously for very different uh, uh, purposes. Uh, so are the, is this mainly guided tours, or is there a lot of in and out uh, from, from, uh, from everybody uh, here? Uh, the, the, I, basically, the, the, the aim of, uh, of what is the market for, for, this, uh, for this museum? Yeah, it's, it's a small museum. There's, um, there are a couple of other exhibits. There was one exhibit that was under construction. Uh, it was a, um, not part of the core exhibit. Uh, and there was a second room that was dedicated to uh, the, uh, the secret police uh, during World War II, which is a, a totally discreet uh, uh, exhibit. This core exhibit, this, this tour was just a core exhibit. Uh, and my sense was that yes, uh, this, they don't get a lot of visitors because when I came in and bought a single ticket, they told me that I could just like, leave my bag in the middle of the room. And it was very clear that, because there was a bench in the middle of the room, it's very clear to me that they didn't expect anybody to enter this room uh, for the rest of the day. So uh, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's not off the beaten path, but um, but it's not one of the museums that you're very likely uh, to, to just accidentally find and wander into. So, so okay, I, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's important to respond to the young man because yeah. right. some of us also grew up in Russia with yeah. different yeah. generations. So. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to formulate my question well, and I could easily get myself uh, dig myself into a hole. But the thing is, I, I think our young uh, our student from Russia is capturing uh, a reality that's true in pretty much any country, which is that people powerfully want to think that their country is basically okay. And I think it's very common for people to want that. And I think wh whenever you, your country does something that you think is not okay, it's often comforting to find out that, you know, or to comfort yourself by thinking, well, all countries do this. So when we, tour, when we, when we uh, 
got caught spying on people, um, uh, the standard response is, well, everybody spies on people. We're just being singled out because we're the United States of America, and people like to single us out. And when we tortured people, you know, everybody tortures people. And I'm not playing the equivalence game. All I'm doing is making the point that this line that you hear presented at this museum, that you then, I think, be beautifully and accurately extend out to the whole world of how, uh, you know, RT and everything, that plays on an incredibly powerful desire on the part of, of people. And um, so my question to you then is, what do you think the effect of it actually is? I mean, what difference does it really make? Since we know we have a wellspring of desire to think these things anyway, how much does it matter that in a society where, after all, people still can get on the internet and still can find out information, it's there, we're still not in China, we're, it's Russia still not there yet, uh, how much of it, what's the delta, what's the, what difference does it make that so much official media is presenting this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, st uh, story that you, that you, yeah. you just described? Yeah. No, I think you're right. It's, um, it wouldn't be effective if it didn't appeal to very basic and very strong desires, right? And a desire to feel good about your country, a desire to feel good about your country in sort of in the context of the wider world uh, is, is, is one of sort of the basic human desires. And that's, um, and I think also the, um, uh, a couple of points I want to, I want to make about it. One is that it, it's, we're still compensating for what happened in the early 90s which was this feeling of uh, uh, suddenly going, uh, some people went abroad, m many more people didn't go abroad but read about what was happening abroad. And this discovery that Russia did not compare well at all to the rest of the world. When uh, this period when uh, the words in the, in the civilized world began, it became a phrase that was used in just about every article as a point of comparison, meaning Russia was not the civilized world. And um, it was this, this, this feeling where for a while you would almost get the sense that uh, people were reveling in the humiliation of it all. And I was recently reading uh, a, a, a Hannah Arendt essay about visiting Germany for the first time in 1950 or 1951, and she describes that very same reveling in uh, I think she calls it impot impotence. You know, just we're helpless, we're awful, we're terrible, we are the defeated. Um, and I think the rebound from that is still occurring, uh, and um, and it's very very strong. And this uh, uh, this 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 message that that Russia is a great country, and certainly no worse than any other country, plays very well into in, into that desire. Uh, now, the other way that it works, and possibly this is much more important, is that, and again, to, to, uh, to, to refer to Arendt, uh, when she describes what, uh, how an, uh, a totalitarian ideology works, uh, she, she talks about the fact that it doesn't have to be a very complicated ideology. It, in fact, it's usually a very primitive idea with a logical construction on top of it. But one thing that it absolutely has to be, it has to be insular and resistant to any arguments from the outside. And I think that, that uh, that's the main purpose that it serves now, is this idea that uh, you can reject any argument, including one that you would find on the internet, uh, by having you know, closed yourself off in this bubble of equivalency. But every place is like that. OK, so this, is, this happened and it's bad, but every place is like that. This is the ultimate, the, 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 the ultimate argument that rejects every other argument a priori. And that's why Russia doesn't have to t shut down the internet uh, to the same extent as, as, as China does, or I don't know if China has to, but anyway. But Russia can can uh, can maintain this incredible uh, sort of ideological and psychological unity in the presence of the internet for uh, for this reason reason among others. I just want to comment because some of us grew up in uh, Russia when the dissidents that were really being caricatured and maligned, and it's not this little exhibit. They're being maligned on television, in publications. Uh, obviously, Sakharov wasn't mentioned in that exhibit because he still has a stature. Right. And so to you, I would say, those of us who were children of dissidents or younger brothers of dissidents, and these were outstanding people. Yikir was not. He had some flaws. But they were brave people, 
wise people, and they were the consciousness of Russia. And the fact that they're being presented in this fashion, this exhibit, yes, it's small, but in a lot of publications, and it's becoming harder and harder to, to s tell the truth about them. And unfortunately, the, your generation, uh, uh, and I have friends my generation who are teaching students who know very little about the 60s, uh, that hurts because I knew them personally and I knew what kind of people they were. And when they're being presented as these CIA stooges again, just like they were you know, when I was growing up, it's like deja vu all over again. And I think that's the message I took out of your lecture. I mean, the, the exhibit was just the sort of the foil. Mm -hmm. And I think one can love your country without being so defensive. And I think there's a difference. We can make fun of our president here and, and critique and still feel good about the country where I find this incredible defensiveness and nationalism that is really taken over the country, even among intelligentsia. And that is, I find, uh, intelligentsia and the new generation, which I was hoping would be different, but there is that kind of, you know, my country right or wrong. And that, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's also something else at play here, which is that we have come to the point, and there was actually, there was a wonderful um, uh, small essay by Alexander Matil. Uh, I can't remember where it was, but if you, uh, just, just recently, uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is Putinism fascism? Uh, we have really come to the point where the question that needs to be answered, and this is true for the intelligentsia in Russia, uh, the question that needs to be answered is, is Russia just like a bad country among uh, many imperfect countries, or is it a particular phenomenon that marks it as sort of the ultimate horror of the 20th century? And that's, that's a really hard thing to talk about, and it's a really hard thing to... Uh, a uh, hard idea to, to entertain, especially when you're living in the country. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so my question is, is uh, I mean, it seems pretty clear to me that this woman, you know, didn't make up this message herself. She just sort of works here and, and tells the story, that the narrative that she's been told. Um, so how do you see this message sort of filtering down uh, from, I don't know, maybe connected to Putin or sort of other higher-ups, and for what purpose? What, what are they trying to gain by presenting this message through even small things like this museum you talked about where, you know, you said it yourself, not really m that many people go to. Yeah. Actually, I don't think it's, uh, the, uh, I think this is one of the great mi misconceptions about sort of the way ru Russia works is that, is that the Kremlin rules every uh, message and, 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 uh, and if something has appeared uh, in, a, in a Russian newspaper, then it's uh, definitely approved by the Kremlin or, uh, or dictated by the Kremlin. That's not the case. Uh, in, in fact, I think this is a really important thing to understand about so the way Russian society is, is, is functioning now, is that so much of this is spontaneous. So much of it is, um, uh, I, I, you know, I imagine that this woman has an education in history, uh, I, or maybe she used to be a, a school teacher. I think that she has done some uh, pretty conscientious re research into what this exhibit is, and and who these people are. And she's tried to construct a story to the best of her understanding of what the story is and what it should be. Now, this idea of what, of what the story should be is uh, uh, a way of her trying to respond to messages that she gets from television and to messages that she thinks she's getting from up above. And uh, she wants to be a good tour guide and a good citizen and a good worker of this particular museum. And this is the, she's interpreting the signals that she is getting, and they come together in this, uh, in, in this tour. And I think that that's, uh, that's one of the scariest things about Russia, is sort of the uniformity in, with which these signals are being interpreted without excessive pressure from above. Yes, that's what uh, all of <laughs> that was almost uh, my question. Uh, wh what else do you know about the woman? Uh, uh, something about her background, her age, uh, her education, uh, uh, at least her age. It's uh, yeah. so. Um, and why does she make all these mistakes, which are sometimes really mistakes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Late 40s, early 50s. Uh, I, I, you know, I said at the beginning uh, that in terms of facts, there is ve there are very few mistakes. Uh, I mean, there, there are very few factual misstatements in this uh, in, in this uh, in this tour. 
Most of it is interpretation, tone, uh, you know, the mess, right? Uh, really, she, uh, I mean, the, the one big factual mistake is putting Prague in Budapest, uh, uh, which is just, you know, poetry. Uh, so I, I think she's, uh, so she's late 40s, early 50s, uh, maybe mid 50s. She's, uh, she's in this low paid job. Uh, I suspect, again, that she, she probably, uh, she's either been a tour guide her whole life or she used to be a secondary school teacher. That's, that's my take. I didn't ask her name and I didn't, I, 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 I didn't uh, ask anything about her. To, for my purposes, it actually wasn't important. I was, uh, I was going for, to many different museums and many different memory sites and sort of trying to document the messages that I was getting there. Uh, I've, um, it so happens I've talked to tour guides in other places uh, at, who are putting across fairly similar messages. And in a lot of the smaller sites, uh, it's one of the few sort of white collar jobs you can get. Uh, in, uh, uh, and somebody who is often better educated than other people in the area, but, um, but less well educated uh, than we would hope. Uh, in the, a lot of the time, again, it's, 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 it's former teachers. They get jobs at these, um, uh, at, uh, at, the, at these memory sites. They have a vague idea of the fact that these memory sites are changing and the presentation of these sites is changing. I, one of the, some of the most interesting conversations I had, I had at PIRM 36, which I don't know if people have heard about PIRM 36, but it's a, it's a gulag, uh, it, uh, it's a unique site in, in, in many respects. It's a, it's a political uh, prisoner's camp that functioned up until 1988. Uh, and very, uh, very soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was safe from falling into total disrepair. Because of course, a, a lot of these gulag sites uh, haven't been preserved because they were meant to be temporary. They were never, they were never permanent constructions, right? Uh, structures, they were, they were there for, the, uh, for the, uh, the temporary project that they were supposed to carry out. And then they would be allowed to fall into disrepair and basically disappear. So this was kept from disappearing. And there was a museum there run by local uh, historians for more than 20 years. And then it was taken over by the state. And if you read about it, you will read that, oh, it's now being used uh, to glorify the gulag. And that's not true at all. That's, uh, it's exactly this, this kind of thing. It's just a total god-awful mess of, of equivalencies, right? Uh, and, um, but the, the people there, uh, a lot of them were somehow involved with the previous incarnation of the museum. The actual tour guides left when the museum was taken over. Assistant tour guides. Volunteer tour guides who were the, who would uh, come for the summer festivals when they uh, when they had fifteen thousand people come and they needed short term tour guides to just like take take this one tour they stepped in so they are sort of the understudies uh, which I think is in a way the story of the country uh, you know they're, they're uh, the sort of the, uh, the 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 people who are not qualified to do these jobs stepping in and doing their jobs to, these jobs to the best of their ability. Uh, without having a lot of material to work with and without having a lot of direction. Okay. Um, thank you so much for, I think, very interesting presentation. And mm -hmm. I just want to commend you for the job that you're doing because th uh, your presentation cuts truly to the nature of uh, the hybrid warfare, something that we're going to talk about tomorrow at the conference. Kind of when you are waging this information war, of course, you have to do your job at home to kind of marshal the support. Uh, but it also cuts through to the nature of the Russian state today, and I think your reference to Alexander Motet's article in Newsweek, uh, Can We Call Putin fasci a Fascist, basically, um, asks the question, if we do, can we then also say that you know, Putin's uh, arguments are understandable, right? Can we argue with such a person rationally and that's exactly the uh, kind of the big question here because if the answer is no then of course uh, you know we cannot expect to understand all the reasons that we are probably are going to be given tomorrow by Stephen Kahn right about kind of the uh, the Russia Russia's feeling of being encircled and all of that and all of that but the question uh, is um, going forward and also looking at the uh, implications of such um, such an information bubble that that is created in Russia uh, is there 
is there any way in to try and counteract um, you know these um, developments when major TV channels, major uh, news outlets are controlled by the state that you know presents this kind of image? Yeah, um, yeah. I think that this is. Uh, th I'm glad you asked this question, and thank you for clarifying that Matil's article was in Newsweek. Uh, the the U.S. government now that it has. Uh, caught on to the fact that Russia has this incredibly powerful and effective propaganda machine, uh, is looking for ways to give away money to fund counter-propaganda, which I think is probably one of the most misguided projects ever invented. Because, uh, again, the whole point of propaganda and what makes it effective is, this, uh, is its insularity and its, its utter resistance to change. And this idea, uh, that's utter resistance to challenge. This idea that if only people saw a more reasonable argument uh, presented in an effective way, or maybe, as we often hear, presented with a little bit of entertainment or you know, uh, hidden in, inside a piece of candy, then, uh, then they would suddenly change their minds. I think it's horribly misguided. I don't have an answer for what to do, but I think this, uh, and fortunately as a journalist, you know, I'm, I'm only supposed to, give to, to, to say what not to do uh, and, uh, and what's wrong. So I think this is terribly wrong. I think the whole idea of counter-propaganda is just, is just very, 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 very wrong and misguided, and another way to waste a whole lot of money and effort. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, mm -hmm. As a historian, somebody who teaches uh, not only Russian history, but but who who tries to explain to my students um, how history uh, uh, is portrayed, how 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 the West today tries to portray Russian history and vice versa. Um, what struck me the, the most, uh, I think what was most fascinating, is, is indeed the mess that her narrative was and how it doesn't fit with some of what we try to say uh, about, you know, this, this was certainly not a speech handed down by Putin. This was certainly not handed down probably even by, by superiors in the museum just mm -hmm. because it was so convoluted in so many different ways and it contrasts, you know, I've shown the, the Yaruski Occupant video, which is, you know, fits our narrative about what mm -hmm. their narrative is much uh, easier. And this is more interesting, I think, in so many ways, just because on the one hand, you know, it's trying to, you know, it's, it's a history of the KGB by, you know, a, a museum of the KGB. And on the other hand, you know, Serov had blood on his hands too. And, and 1937 is the, the heart of evil. and. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of the, you know, uh, I'm, I'm wrapping my head around it, but, but, it, but what struck me, the mo to, to ask us a, a more, more specific question, what struck me the most was something you, you mentioned at the very beginning was the way that, uh, as I understood it, they um, begin the history of the KGB in the 1950s, and it seems to be completely divorced, or at least there's this, there's this very, um, purposeful effort to separate it from NKVD, Gepau, Chekhov before it, that this is part of the narrative they're presenting. And, and is there anything in this museum about the history of the security apparatus before, uh, before the KGB itself? And, and yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. No, there isn't. Uh, and, uh, and again, I, don't, I think this is one of those um, places that actually point to this not being you know, uh, an expression of sort of uh, higher will. Uh, because of course, Putin very much sees himself as, uh, as the, an heir uh, uh, of the Cheka, right? And there is this idea that there's this continuous history uh, from the Cheka to the FSB. This particular museum decided that it was going to be a museum of the KGB. It probably only had uh, exhibits that, could st that started in the 1950s. It, maybe this building uh, only became a KGB building in 1954. That's, I would suspect the reason lies in something like that. So they begin the story in 1954 when Kagube actually appeared, right? So that's, and, and they begin it with, uh, with Sirov. The thing about history uh, in Russia, though, is, uh, is that in this mess of sort of past and present, and this, uh, in this incredible seamless story, this, it also, uh, that, 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 you know, directly from Ivan the Terrible, uh, it, it also means that you can start anywhere. 
you don't have clear beginning points. So you may as well start in 1954. Yeah, if I could uh, return to the propaganda machine and to, to Olmsk as well, I think there's a, there's a connection here and to the, the question that came from the back. I agree 100% that it's a it's a, a, a ridiculous move to launch a proper uh, a counter propaganda campaign in this context. Perhaps also uh, in part due to the superficial nature of the reception of that. True, it's a narrative being created by tour guides on the ground, but if an entire class of high school students in Omsk can sit and listen perfectly well to that and recognize the fallacies built into it. One has to wonder to, to how deep and how effective does that propaganda actually go. I think this is the very interesting question as to, as to the, the efficacy of the machine uh, on, on, the, on the Russian population. Um, you know, I, um, I can't help noticing that we're at Dartmouth University uh, and I actually kind of doubt that an entire class of high school students from Omsk can get to Dar Dartmouth after graduating. Uh, I, I don't think that's a proper generalization. Mm -hmm. May I make a quick question? Yes. I went to a public high school in Omsk, so I think I'm pretty much... I think when they say general class of Russian high school students, it's quite a good generalization. Right, that but was I a can't help school, noticing that you are the in. only person from that class at this university. Uh, and, uh, and I think that probably marks you as quite extraordinary. Yeah, but there are other factors that factor in, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I was it's more of a sort of suggestion or invitation to reflexivity. Uh, so uh, what, what the tour guide is doing is, of course, something which may be called a strong reading, sort of mis misinterpreting or messing up and constructing uh, the historical narrative. But I think us here and, and your presentation is also a pretty strong reading. And so there is, for, for me, there is sort of a, well, I wouldn't call it a symmetry or equivalence, but I feel there is a sort of a rhyme in what she is doing, what you're doing. And, and of course, I understand that she, she, she is doing. So it's a very, very horrible mis misconceptualizing of Russian history. But at some points, if you go through your presentation, you see uh, the question of uh, whether the word terror has to be there. I think it's not just the most natural way to uh, talk about these things in Russian, and repression is quite normal. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the word genocide, I completely agree that uh, genocide does presuppose a subject. So she's been sort of some historically self-critical. Some of what she's saying is uh, pretty much common sense. It is not a 30, 1937, as everybody would agree. Uh, so uh, your very last slide, where you have uh, like this is sort of translations from uh, her text to some conceptual text, uh, seems to be a sort of a, so in many cases, I think you are sort of uh, reading into her uh, something which I don't, so, so, and I think this is a little bit of a problem for me because I would rather sort of move to the place where there is n no activity like this is happening, neither uh, coming from her uh, nor from us uh, sort of misreading as sort of a little bit exaggerating or interpreting. Um, you, you, so I'm not saying that you are mis misinterpreting, but I think it's a pretty strong reading. You're basically doing uh, uh, Putinist propaganda out of her. and. It's by some, I, I feel there is a little bit of it. There is a, a little bit of an absolutely normal sort of messy attitude to history just because of the uh, absence of education. And then there is a, a, a lot of, uh, like, there is a half uh, glass half empty or glass, uh, glass half full. Actually, if you look at this from some other eyes, uh, the, 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 um, there is a very unequivocal moral uh, evaluation, a moral attitude, yes. It's called genocide, yes. It's called horrible. Yes, uh, so th there are some commonsensical and pretty important differences between what's ethical and what's legal. Um, other things, as has been pointed out, uh, yes, moral equivalence is a pretty bad cognitive procedure, uh, but uh, sort of having a perspective and uh, indeed uh, knowing that uh, these are not completely unique Soviet Russian uh, institutions and phenomena, so sort of very normal, of course you, you may argue with 
whether we should sort of uh, not employ something like that. At uh, what moment it becomes moral equivalence versus uh, just being uh, educated and having things in perspective. So basically what I'm asking you to do is, uh, could you apply the same sort of analysis you did to, to us or to yourself? <laughs> uh, so, um, I mean, I didn't you know, catapult myself into this KGB museum in uh, St. Petersburg without ever having visited another tour or, uh, or, or having read and heard a lot about the, uh, the work or the lack of work of memory in Russia over the last few years. Right? It's, a, it's a part of my research. I've uh, decided to use this because I think it's exemplary. Right? Uh, so that's why I, uh, I reserve the right to, to this reading. Uh, the last slide was absolutely an exaggeration, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But um, uh, now, uh, getting back to the word terror, uh, the reason I focused on the lack of the word terror is because that is an ongoing battle. And it's a ba battle that has been lost uh, by uh, Memorial, you know, which is now seen as a spy and a foreign agent and you know, the, an agent of the Nazis, the CIA, and the internet. Um, and, um, and there are some really fascinating ways in which the word terror uh, has been rejected, including uh, when uh, another site that I, that, I, that I visited just in April is the uh, Sandarmok. Sandarmok was the first execution, uh, uh, the first site of a mass execution of the Great Terror. It's October 1937. Uh, it's unique for, for, uh, in, in, in many respects. It's the first site. It's also uh, extremely well documented because it was um, more than a thousand people from Salafki who were sort of the, the, the prisoner elite. Uh, they have biographies and they have, uh, in many cases, or had at least 20 years ago, living relatives. It's also the first place where a memorial st uh, was placed uh, in the 1990s. So I wrote about it in 1997 when that memorial was open and I went back in, in April. Uh, and it's fascinating what's happened to it. It's, um, it's now a huge, uh, I, I don't even what, know what to call it. It's a, it's a huge space of many, many, many spontaneous and not so spontaneous uh, memorials. There are uh, nearly a thousand Various ki of various kinds of memorials uh, that are placed there. The, uh, the word terror appears once on a stone that is placed by a yacht club. Memorial, uh, they're wonderful people. They actually track down these stones or these, uh, or these mark markers or whatever because a lot of the time it doesn't say where they come from. Uh, so this yacht club placed a, a stone that says, that says terror on it. So this is a, um, the first site of mass execution of the great terror. And the word terror appears once and not on any of the, uh, of, uh, of the, of the markers or, or stones placed by any official entity. Now, there's another reason for that as well, which is that most of the official entities, uh, you know, they have to commission a local stone maker, monument maker, to create the memorial. And it turns out that the local stonemakers, there are a couple of competing ones, but they actually edit out the word terror every time they're commissioned to place a stone there. So there are some pretty weird texts on, on, some, of these, um, on some of these markers because the word terror has been thrown out. I mean, it's a hugely contested word. And so its, it's absence in this tour is conspicuous. Uh, that's, that, that's why I pointed it out. Um, now, Actually, I, I realized that I sort of uh, I got I got carried away with Omsk, so I want to I want to uh, to go uh, back to the previous question and and just clarify. I don't think that the the facts or the misfacts or the lacking facts are key to propaganda in any case, in, in, including this case. I think what's key to it is the worldview, and I think that the worldview is consistent, and that's the underlying layer, and it's incredibly effective, and, and it, it's all permeating. But the message itself, yeah, it doesn't have to be effective. It doesn't have to take hold because there was another message coming tomorrow that can, uh, that can take up residence in that exact place with, uh, for, 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 for just as long as the, as the, as the old message. But, 
Uh, did I answer your, your question, yeah. Michelle? Yeah. All right, um, we are actually out of time, and I want to thank you, Masha, for a fascinating, powerful, and really provocative talk. And I also thank the audience for your participation and your excellent questions. Um, so thank you for coming, and I hope you come to our event tomorrow that begins at 10 a.m. in 41 Haldeman. And that will be kicked off by another keynote by Stephen Cohen, Why Cold War Again? Stephen Cohen is Professor Emeritus at Princeton and NYU. And then it will be followed by two round tables and also a film about the conflict in Ukraine. So please join us tomorrow beginning at 10 a.m. in Haldeman 41. Okay, thank you.